The story I want to share with you today starts in a place that many of you might not even believe exists. It's a farm in New Jersey. I know, right? Uh, we're called the Garden State for a reason, and I have photographic evidence of this. This particular farm is my family's small vineyard. It's a place where I spent a lot of time working as I grew up. When you work on a farm, you have a lot of time to think, because your hands are occupied working the plants. So I had a lot of time to think, and one of the things that I often thought about uh, was solar power, right? And how we could make solar work better on our farm. We had attempted to install solar panels, and it just didn't work out uh, for a number of different reasons. So I thought to myself, how can we make solar work better on farms? But this was seven years ago, and I was in high school. I know we got some high schoolers in the room today, and you guys know what I did? I didn't do anything. I, had no, I didn't know the, any of the tools at that time. So I went ahead and I went to school, and I found myself two years later at the University of Pennsylvania when this thing came back to me uh, one night when I was distracted from my homework. So that question came back into my head, and this time it brought with it an image. And what an image that was. I sketched it out on my desk, and this is that first sketch of this idea, which is you know, barely visible, and wow, what an idea, a revolutionary idea. What if instead of using large solar panels, we could use thin light mirrors to focus sunlight onto very small solar cells? Those mirrors could fold up, creating a device that was very deployable and therefore worked really well on farms. Now, this was a completely original idea. Nobody had ever done anything like it. By the end of that year, we had a prototype and a patent. The following year, we got our VC funding, and we just sold the company last year. Now, some of you are probably wondering, saying, wow, that's great, but why haven't I heard of you? Because that's not how it happened. Um, <laughs> so that's just how I saw it playing out that night as I sat at my desk. Um, it seemed like it was going to be great. Uh, but this isn't a story today about getting rich quick. It's the story of a five-year fight to take this idea from that moment of inspiration and possibility to something that can actually make a difference in the world. Uh, and it's, it's not, I'm not here to wow you with entrepreneurial prowess, because I've probably done about as many things right as I have wrong uh, through the course of the years. I think of it more as a letter from the front lines of, of possibilities and passion. And I can tell you how we got as far as we have, but I can't tell you how the story's going to end. But I've got a couple of tips that I picked up along the way. They are, talk about your idea as much as you possibly can. Uh, try to prove it to the best of your ability, and when things change, and they will, adapt your idea to fit whatever the new reality is. So let's go back to our story. What happened when I Googled this idea, this original sketch? Well, it turned out there was a 25-year-old industry behind the idea of mirrors and small solar cells, so it wasn't going to be that easy. Um, but there was something unique here. The, the motion of the mirrors and the fact that it made a deployable device that worked well on farms was unique. And I kind of got caught up in this thing, and I pushed it over the course of that year through more detailed sketches and 3D models, starting out kind of hilariously primitive and then becoming something that's pretty cool looking. And before I knew it, all I could do was look around and see these things everywhere. They didn't have a name at the time. They later became the power flower just because of the way the aesthetic worked out. Very memorable name, worked out quite well when we were pitching it around because people just couldn't forget us. What are you going to do? So this was the power flower, and it was still an idea that was very much in my head, and I was working on it on my own, but the project didn't get interesting until we started talking about it to people. So I talked about it to my friends, and I recruited lifelong friend Pat Murphy, there we are on the soccer team together, uh, to be you know, uh, my partner in this adventure, and he was, I guess, dumb enough to join up. <laughs> Uh, but he's been a great asset to the team ever since. He actually, while I was out here having fun, fun at TED, he locked in some funding for us. So go, Pat. Thank you for taking that step with me so many years ago. So there we were. Now there were two of us, two crazy kids with an idea. And we started talking to anybody who would listen. And it started off primitive. We didn't really have a name or a clue, uh, but we talked about it. And it got a little bit better, and we had a generic name and incredibly lofty goals. Uh, and we talked about it. Uh, and we just went on from there. But at some point, talk becomes cheap, especially with physical things. You know, does it work? That's quite the question. We had our pretty renderings. And boy, they were looking nice by this point. But you can't sell a rendering, or you shouldn't sell a rendering. Probably could. Uh, so we needed to prove that this technology would work. So over the course of a year, with some engineers at the University of Pennsylvania, we made an actual prototype. And we machined it out of stock. And it was incredibly exciting. And it pushed, sometimes it pushed the limits of our endurance uh, and our sanity like every now and again. <laughs> Late night in the lab. And, but in the end, it came together. And it was really exciting to see this beautiful prototype that emerged from all of our hard work uh, through the years. Now, what did it end up proving? Well, it only kind of worked, uh, which was not the best situation for us. But it proved that we could do physical things. We could make stuff. 
And as we learned when we brought our prototype and brought our business plan around, stuff is incredibly difficult. Uh, and it's hard to get into uh, when you're an underfunded startup and you're young. It, isn't that social? Uh, I can't sell this thing in an app store. And it's just a lot of the things that people don't want to be hearing right now. We were out there pitching it around as PowerFlower Solar. We were going to bring solar to grid remote applications like irrigation, military, disaster relief. And we we're going to do it with our PowerFlower, which was the best portable solar generator we pitched. So we were PowerFlower Solar, and we got nowhere. We talked to a lot of people, and they thought we were nuts. Uh, somebody once recommended that instead of doing this, we make a website about solar power. I didn't know what to say to that. I was like, well, you're probably right. That'd probably work out a lot faster. Um, <laughs> anyway, so we actually got our big break one day in a very unexpected place. We were at a local farmer's market talking to potential customers, you know, seeing you know, what they thought of our new prototype and our new, you know, this, this product. And we ran into somebody who turned out to be the Assistant Secretary of Agriculture for the state of New Jersey. I really liked the idea. What was he doing there? I, I had served in vegetables there for years. I had no idea who he was, but it turned out that he was someone who was able to help us. And through him, we got in touch with many organizations in the New Jersey government who were excited about clean technology and excited about keeping clean technology in the state. We ended up applying for a grant. And we actually completed that application in a week while raising matching funds for it. It was a very <laughs> intense process, but we were students, so we were used to staying up all night. So we applied for that grant. This is now, to get you back into the timeline, this was about a year and a half ago that we put that application in, so last September. And then we found out. In December, that we had an opportunity to pitch for this grant, we went in and gave a great pitch. We'd been pitching to investors for a while, and we knew that was at least one thing we could do. So we gave a great pitch. And then just about a year ago today, we learned that we got a $500,000 R&D grant from the state of New Jersey. $500,000. Wow. Um, that was awesome. <laughs> So we had our grant, we had our funding, and we had all the resources that we needed to finally do this thing. The hard part was over. We were out of the labyrinth, and this was, it was going to be smooth sailing, right? Maybe. I mean, it was fun, it was fun for a while. We were carefree, and this idea was coming into the world. But then one day, we learned firsthand that sometimes things change, and you have to adapt your ideas to fit the new realities. It was supposed to be one of those fun design meetings, you know, where Post-it notes cover the walls and prototypes are made on the fly. It was supposed to be like that. Uh, but when we walked into the office and I sat down, I could tell the energy was off in the room. There was something wrong. And uh, the head of the product development firm that we were working with at the time, and we still are, and they're great folks, Bresler Group, uh, they, a local Philadelphia firm, looked at us across the table and said, Jason, uh, we got to talk about something. That something was something we had asked them to do. We'd asked them to look uh, and find some data for us. And what we wanted them to do was prove that this CPV, or concentrated photovoltaics, or this mirrors and small solar cells technology, was the right solution for the problem that we were trying to solve. We knew it, right? We knew, and we'll get back to that, that it was the right solution. But we needed them to find some data so we could convince other people. Because clearly we were right. So thankfully, in the long run, they were slightly more objective than we were. Um, and I sat through a two-hour meeting where I learned in excruciating detail that my great idea from so many years ago was not, in fact, that great. In fact, there were many options that could work out a whole lot better. It was kind of wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, this is a couple years into the process that we were learning this. Um, there's really only one way to describe an event like this. I think that pretty much. <laughs> sums it up. <laughs> um, and I can laugh about it now, but oh my god, was it not funny back then. <laughs> oh my god. Um, we got through it, though, and we're, I'm here now as still the CEO of PowerFlower Solar, and we're still in it, so it's clearly something happened. Uh, but at that time, in that moment, it, things looked really hopeless. The heart of our project, what we had pitched as the innovative thing, had been essentially ripped out. We were now the brilliant young inventors without an invention. That's a problem. Um, so this was not a very fun week. And there were, it was a, probably the, I guess, darkest corner of the labyrinth, to borrow the language uh, used earlier. And in order to get ourselves out, we had to figure out how we got there. We had to ask how and, and why did this happen. And it's easy to blame you know, the world and other people, but sometimes you got to take ownership and realize that you did a couple of things wrong. And it turned out it was a simple human mistake. I was very passionate about this idea. And because of that passion, I created a nice little safe zone, maybe say this red uh, rug here. And in this zone, I was correct. I was a visionary. 
And this zone had all the information that I thought that I needed, but the world was much bigger, but I ignored it, right? This was my idea. It was great. Obviously, it is, and I looked just here and found all the evidence I needed to support that. I didn't need to know everything. Occasionally, I would venture out, always keeping my eye on that great idea. I would look for information, and when I didn't find it, I was like, thank God, my idea is still the best. <laughs> um, you all know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> So this is not a great way to go through the process. And what happened was that day at Bresler Group, they pushed us away from that comfort zone. And we found something that had been there the whole time, information that said we did not have the best idea. And we found it. And it was awful. But it was there. And if we hadn't found it at that point, we would have found it at some other point further down the line we had spent more money. So now we knew. Our great idea could be better. And there's a serious flaw. So we had to fix it. We had to get out of this hole. So the question now is, OK, what now? Well, we could have walked away. We could have said, thank you, State of New Jersey, for your support. But we were wrong. Here's your money back. Here's all the investors. Here's your money back. We're going to walk away from this. But screw that. Uh, we were here. We were getting out of this problem. And that's you know, the way we wanted to address it. We weren't going to walk away after so many years. Uh, that's not necessarily a rational decision, but it was the right one at the time. So we decided to stick with it. And we needed to change. We needed to adapt what we were doing. So we, were a, we, we went from being 100% certain about our old solution to being completely lost. And this was a very different situation, but it was one that turned out not to be that bad. Over the years, the idea had grown bigger than the manifestation as the product. And we understood the problem, our customers. We understood a lot of stuff. And for some reason, that solution had stayed the same the whole time. But now that solution was gone. And we could really try to solve this problem. And we had resources. We had a team. And it really wasn't that bad when we took stock. Uh, that's not to say that it was easy to get out of that hole. I mean. The month of January and February were incredibly stressful. Sure, the product designer in me was loving kind of tinkering around with the possibilities of solar and trying to figure out how it fit the needs of our market. It was a really exciting process, but at the same time, my inner CEO was freaking out because we were burning time and money. And that, that schedule that we had pitched to everybody was, you know, we were going to fall behind if we spent much more time in this creative, fun world. But slowly, surely, something bubbled up, something that was not the product of a... Of a random moment at a desk uh, in, you know, in the mind of some freshman. But this was a product that was truly designed to meet a need. And now that we've you know, come out of the labyrinth, we've got something that could actually make a difference on the battlefield, in disaster relief situations, in developing nations. This idea now is so much better than it was before. And we had no idea until we learned this piece of information. So passion is great, and it can take you far, but eventually you're going to be exposed to everything, and you're going to have to adapt. So we can leave you with three, you know, the three basic tips as you guys go through your own adventures and ideas. Talk about your ideas, prove them the best you can, and when push comes to shove, and you learn that the world is much bigger than you thought it was and much scarier, adapt and overcome. And I wish you all the best of luck as you go through your own journeys.